Pythagoras was a very influential pre-Socratic philosopher. Life was approximately 570 to 495 BC. Just a little bit about his background in terms of the context of what's going on in the world. Pythagoras was a contemporary of Buddha and Confucius, and that's not merely a coincidence. We can see some influence or some some confluence of ideas with those great leaders. He reportedly traveled a lot, so including Egypt, Babylonia, and so on, but uh, he didn't really write a lot on his own. That was left to his followers primarily. But he was a significant religious leader, like Buddha and Confucius, and after his death, the Pythagoreans divided into two groups who followed his teachings. Those who followed his more mathematical and philosophical teachings were called, the, the teachings themselves rather, were called the Mathematicoi. And those who followed his religious and moral teachings, that is the Acousmaticoi, obviously Mathematicoi has that root of math. Acousmaticoi is on the things heard roughly, and so we have those two groups, one focusing on moral and religious concerns, one on the more philosophical and mathematical concerns. Turning to the moral concern, his, his main concern, you might say, was living the right kind of life. Right? He thought that discovering the true nature of the world was going to be important in doing that. That was key for living the right kind of life. And so he blended the metaphysical, the ethical, and the religious concerns. So even though we separate the mathematicoi from the acousmaticoi, I see them as very much blended together and interdependent. One way of saying this is uh, the way that Merrill Ring put it, he sought to understand the world in order to get right with it, right? He wanted to understand the world so that he could live properly according to the principles of the world. One of the factors in doing that then was the soul. And Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans believed in the transmigration of souls. Now, that's strictly speaking a little different from reincarnation, but for our purposes here, roughly that's the idea that, that we have souls that continue to exist after our death, and so that a person may come back as an animal or even a plant or another person. And especially thinking about people coming back as animals, that might lead to vegetarianism. This is a way that understanding the world, if you understand that souls transmigrate after death, then that might influence the way you live, that is by not eating animals. He talked a lot about the soul, the Greek word there is psyche and, uh, or psyche, more, more naturally in the Greek, and saying that that is immortal. Now normally the word that we might call psych was understood as a life principle. It's whatever it is that makes things alive. And we'll, we'll see that understanding in, in Aristotle. But it wasn't as typical for people to think about a soul that could exist apart from a living body. And so it's possible, according to the Pythagoreans, to break out of this cycle of transmigration the various incarnations, and then to be united with or assimilated into the divine. And there we certainly see the influence of the teachings of the Buddha. For the Pythagoreans, study was a spiritual activity because the more you understand, right, the more that's going to influence the way you live. So Pythagoreans practiced religious rites from other traditions, they incorporated some of those, but they also introduced this idea of studying or inquiry as a spiritual activity, as something that's important for our souls. And the idea is that theorizing is a way to purify the spirit. Intellectual activities, then, 
become a way to align oneself with reality. Uh, this is similar to the idea of, of knowing God as an important part of salvation, as an important part of, of living a right kind of life. So discovering and contemplating the nature of reality brought this rectitude to the soul, this uprightness or righteousness to one's soul as you contemplate the nature of reality, doing metaphysics, for example. Also, mathematics was a key component of the intellectual and spiritual activity. And so we need to say a lot more about the realm of mathematics for the Pythagoreans. They were among the first to think of mathematics as a realm distinct from the particular objects that we encounter. And so instead of thinking as numbers, just as, as identifying how many books are on the desk, something like that, Numbers exist in a different realm, a separate realm from the physical things that we see and hear and taste and touch. So the Pythagoreans were borrowing from the Babylonians and the Egyptians, but they did introduce this idea of, of universal truths, or even more importantly, maybe necessary truths of mathematics. So the famous Pythagorean theorem in geometry, the the idea that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that is true for all right triangles, regardless of how large they are, regardless of what they are made of. So that is a truth that exists independently of the physical realm. Just as an illustration here with uh, the idea of a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we have this pink right triangle, and you can see C squared being made by these triangles. So we're keeping the area the same here, and as we move things around, now it's very clear that on the left we have A squared, on the right we have B squared, and that total area equals C squared. So there's this correlation then between mathematics and the empirical world. The empirical world that which we sense, the physical matter that we are familiar with, has to follow these mathematical principles. So that's not only true with things like triangles and other geometric objects, it's true with music. So there is this non-sensible realm, this distinct realm of necessary truths that has a greater reality than the physical world itself. And this realm is more reliable, trustworthy, more knowable, more permanent than the physical world. So let's take music as an example. The Pythagoreans discovered that the ratios of notes were important, and that regardless of the material, whether the instrument is made of, of catgut string or other kinds of strings of, of tubes, the original size of the instrument, whatever it is, there's going to be a two to one ratio among notes on an octave apart. So today, uh, we would write that out with letters. So we have a C scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. That's a full scale identifying those notes. And there are ratios then, a two to one ratio between the C's on the ends. And this is called the octave, right? Eight notes here. And then there are ratios such as the fifths. So this, a string ratio, two strings, that would be a three to two ratio, if you started with the, the two and then go upwards to the three size, right, increasing the length, I'm going the opposite direction, sorry, starting with the G is the two, and then the three would be the C on the lower end, you have this three to one ratio going from C to G. And then there are fourths, that's a four to three ratio. That's going from C to F. And so the ratios of the lengths of the strings or the lengths of the tubes 
are going to give you this pattern regardless what material you're talking about. And so the, the idea is this other realm, this truth of math mathematics, these ratios, and that tells or determines what's going on in the physical realm. There is a music of the spheres also. So Pythagoreans thought that celestial bodies themselves produce music in a beautiful harmony. So we have that phrase, music of the spheres. Now, for Pythagoras, they were only familiar with six planets up through Saturn. Right? They, at the ancient Greek world, was not aware of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And so he had in the celestial realm six planets, a moon, and a sun. So those are eight entities that make an octave. Obviously, a, a little problem there the more we've learned about the world, but that's how they viewed it. The ratios then, the, the mathematical truths, are more important than the matter, as we talked about with the instruments. So Pythagorean thought was important for later distinction because of this later distinction between form and matter. So we see Plato making that distinction between the material realm and then the realm of the form. So we'll cover that more carefully as we move on to Plato. The tetratus is a way of representing numbers. So taking it from the top, we have one, and then two, and then three, and then four. And so we're counting, obviously. We're making a nice triangle, obviously. I may not have formed that perfectly on the screen there, but the, we have these ratios that we just talked about with music. One to two, two to three, three to four. So that's pretty cool, thought uh, the Pythagoreans. We also have the number 10 then, the number 10 being complete. And so we use a base 10 system to, to count. And so that helps make sense of it as well. We can also talk about squares being formed by adding odd numbers to one. So we start there with that tiny dot one. We add the next odd number three and we get a square. Right? And the, the square is two squared equaling four. And so we had the next set of odd numbers. So we had five more dots like so, and we have a square with nine dots. Three squared equals nine. So we can do this again by adding seven more dots to our square, and we now have 16 dots, which is four squared. Right? And this can go on by adding nine more and then 11 more, et cetera, and you get five squared and six squared, et cetera. And so that nice pattern developing was something that the Pythagoreans uh, recognized, and it seems to be a pretty cool idea. So for the pa Pythagoreans, insofar as they would identify an arche, it would be number. And there is beauty and truth in mathematics that goes beyond what our senses can perceive. This idea of the tetratus, of forming squares, of, of ratios. This is getting us into this other realm that is permanent, right? And it acts with necessary uh, relationships. And so they came to believe that all things that exist in the material realm are ratios or numbers. And they had ideas like justice or marriage or uh, any kind, any number of ideas that they thought were correlated to ratios or numbers of so, some sort. And so you might say that the RK of all things is numbers. There's a numerical order to all that exists, and that numerical order has greater ontological status than the physical realm. Now, that idea was extremely important and influential for Socrates and Plato, and in fact, contemporaries of Pythagoras, their lives overlapped uh, Pythagoras just a bit for Socrates, uh, for Plato much more. And 
So they develop that idea, Plato especially develops that idea very thoroughly, that there is a realm distinct from the physical world that is permanent and composed of necessary truths. Extremely important idea for the direction that philosophy goes after that. 